All right, good day to you, uh, or good night, depending on where you are. I um, just did a video talking about the uh, political situation in the United States, and I was asked to kind of do a deeper dive on what's going on um, and what I think is paramount to understanding the current political, economic, social, cultural situation is to get a grasp of the media and the medium in which we communicate in, which is more important than the actual pieces of communication that are exchanged. And in doing so, it's absolutely paramount to read and understand Marshall McLuhan. This book, Understanding Media, is a, a good place to start. And I've read, I just started reading, uh, I've read through the first three chapters, and I'm going to just briefly go over them uh, and read a little bit from them. And I want to use these ideas to explore our current situation Um again, in terms of our political, social, and communal situation uh, that we find ourselves in um, with the new forms of media, um, you know, social media, and these decentralized platforms that have uh, are now colliding with the older centralized broadcast media of television and even radio. And we're seeing uh, a clash here and an intensity that's been increased that needs to be um, understood. And Marshall was... Uh, writing, I think he wrote this in 1964, and he is he is <laughs> like pointing out the water to fish. That's that's kind of how I see the way that he is, uh, you know, articulating these ideas. Um, if you're interested in these types of ideas, I I would suggest you to check out um, um, Andrew McLuhan, who is um, Marshall McLuhan's grandson, who has a um, YouTube. Um, a YouTube channel called the McLuhan Institute. And he's doing some great stuff with his uh, grandfathers and his father, uh, his father's work who, who did some great work kind of, kind of advancing and, um, and, and coming up with his own ideas. Um, so I, I implore you to check him out. His, his dad's name was Eric McLuhan. I believe he just passed a couple years ago here. Um, but these ideas are uh, absolutely necessary to understand our particular predicament. And it's important to look at the structures that uh, we are being, um, that are wielding these these technologies uh, rather than looking at the individual content of the technologies, right? So the way that Twitter, uh, any individual tweet, whether from the president or anyone else, is more, uh, is less impactful than the way that Twitter has reorganized our uh, relationships with our, our self, with other, and is quite literally and practically re organizing our nervous system. So these are important uh, concepts to understand, um, to really dig in and uh, hopefully find some sort of a path through these intense times. Um, so in Marshall McLuhan's Understanding Media, so what is media? It says, understanding media, the extensions of man. So media are extensions of man. And by media, uh, it's not just the media that we see on TV or, or television. Media are essentially the tools that we use and that use us to structure our uh, being in the world. So um, the our sense of, so the media are the extensions of our senses. So our eyes are extended by the media of the telescope and the microscope right? And they even, you know, are physically similar with the aperture that focuses in and out. So the invisible, the, the visible eye can only see so much. So man has created the telescope to, to gaze into the stars and the microscope to look at the hidden forces, the hidden physical forces that underlie, you know, the world that we live in. Um, so the, the car is a, an extension our, of our um, sense of locomotion, of our ability to move. Right, so we have four wheels, like we have four limbs, arms, and legs, and any individual car and a type of car is less important than the way that um, vehicles have uh, restructured the way that cities and urban areas are related to each other. The way that the uh, the highway system has again reorganized and restructured. Uh, the way that we work in the world, the way that we communicate and relate to each other. So any particular content of media is less impactful than the form, the formal structure of the media itself. Uh, and the first chapter here that we're going to kind of dig into just a little bit is the uh, the medium is the message. And that's his most famous uh, kind of idiom 
that is, a lot of people are familiar with, but I don't think a lot of people really understand it and grok it. And I'm not saying that I do uh, as well, but I'm, I'm certainly engaging with it. And I would implore you to do so as well and, and purchase this book. It's not expensive. This is a, a recent, um, it's a recent uh, copy. And it's got some commentary, but I'm not so interested in the commentary as into actually digging into to Marshall's ideas. Um, one more example of how our tools are extensions of ourselves, and this is probably the best one um, that I've come across, and it came from a talk that I saw from Eric McLuhan, and, and is the fork, right? The fork is the extension of the hand, and quite you know, uh, homologous, what does a fork look like? It's got fingers, it's got a little palm. Right, and it's got an it's got a, um, an arm, and essentially, so you can see how the fork is an extension of the arm. Um, and when we uh, use these ideas to look at the new technological um, advances and and platforms that are used, like platforms like Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and Snapchat, and um, the interesting part is how these new technologies, how they differ from the old ones, how their interaction and their um, combination is causing this intense, confusing, hallucinatory, hypnotizing state that we all find ourselves in when we're trying to to make sense of the world that um, we find ourselves in here. So I'm just going to read the first page of this chapter. Again, the first chapter of the medium is the message, and it does a great job of just uh, giving a broad overview of this concept here. So Here's Marshall. In a culture like ours, long accustomed to splitting and dividing all things as means of control, it is sometimes a bit of a shock to be reminded that, in operational and practical fact, the medium is the message. This is merely to say that the personal and social consequences of any medium, that is, of any extension of ourselves, results from the new scale that is introduced into our affairs by each extension of ourselves or by any new technology. I'll read that again. In a culture like ours, long accustomed to splitting and dividing all things as a means of control, it is sometimes a bit of a shock to be reminded that, in operational and practical fact, the medium is the message. This is merely to say that the personal and social consequences of any medium, that is, of any extension of ourselves, result from the new scale that is introduced into our affairs by each extension of ourselves or by any new technology. I remember Marshall was writing this in the mid-60s where... Uh, the electric age was coming into full gear with the television, which was um, kind of usurping the role of the radio. Uh, the radio is thought of as a, and we're going to talk about this in the second chapter, there are hot and, and cold mediums. The um, hot medium of the, tel- or of the uh, radio, right? What makes a, a medium hot is its centralizing and um, singular mode of action. And we'll talk about this more when we get to that chapter, but let me read a little bit more here. So thus, with automation, for example, the new patterns of human association tend to eliminate jobs. It is true. This is the negative result. Positively, automation creates roles for people, which is to say, depth of involvement in their work in human association that our preceding mechanical technology had destroyed. Many people would be disposed to say that it was not the machine, but what what, what one did with the machine that was its meaning or or its message. In terms of the ways in which the machine altered our relations to one another and to ourselves, it mattered not in the least whether it turned our our cornflakes or Cadillacs, right? I'm going to read that again. So, in terms of the ways in which the machine altered our relations to one another and to ourselves... It mattered not in the least whether it turned out our cor- our cornflakes or our Cadillacs. Great, concise way of thinking of how the, the medium is the message. Um, I'll continue a little bit more here. The restructuring of human work and association was shaped by the technique of fragmentation that is the essence of machine technology. The essence of automation technology is the opposite. It is integral and decentralist in depth. Just as the machine was fragmentary, centralist, and superficial in its patterning of human relationships. The instance of the electric light may prove illuminating in this connection. The electric light is pure information. It is a medium without a message, as it were, unless it is used to spell out some verbal ad or name. The fact, this fact, characteristic of all media, means that the content of any medium is always another medium. 
The content of writing is speech. Just as the written word is the content of print, and print is the content of the telegraph. If it is asked, what is the content of speech? It is necessary to say it is an actual process of thought, which is in itself nonverbal. I'm going to read that part one more time here. So the insistence the instance of the electric light may prove illuminating in this connection. The electric light is pure information. It is a medium without a message as it were, unless it is used to spell out some verbal ad or name. This fact, characteristic of all media, means that the content of any medium is always another medium. And here he's going to give some examples here. So the content of writing is speech. Just as the content of the telegraph, uh, just as the content of the written word is the content, uh, just as the written word is the content of print, and print is the content of the telegraph. If it is asked, what is the content of speech? It is necessary to say it, it, it is an actual process of thought, which is itself nonverbal. Now, this whole chapter is excellent. I'm going to read just a little bit from the end of it, and then we're going to move on to a, a quick review of chapter two. Uh, so McLuhan writes here, if the formative power in the media are the media themselves, that raises a host of large matters that can only be mentioned here, although they deserve volumes. Namely, that the technological media are staples or natural resources, exactly as are coal and cotton and oil. Anybody will concede that a society whose economy is dependent upon one or two major staples like cotton or grain or lumber or fish or cattle is going to have some obvious social patterns of organization as a result. Stress on a few major staples creates extreme instability in the economy, but great endurance in the population. The pathos and humor of the American South are embedded in such an economy of limited staples, for a society configured by reliance on a few commodities accepts them as a social bond quite as much as the metro metropolis does the press. Cotton and oil, like radio and TV, become fixed charges on the entire psychic life of the community, and this pervasive fact creates the unique cultural flavor of any society. It pays through the nose and all its other senses for each staple that shapes its life. That our human senses, of which all media are extensions, are also fixed charges on our personal energies, and that they also configure the awareness and experience of each of us, may be perceived in another connection mentioned by the psychologist Carl Jung. And here's a quote from Jung. Every Roman was surrounded by slaves. The slave and his psychology flooded ancient Italy, and every Roman became inwardly and, of course, unwittingly a slave. Because living constantly in the atmosphere of slaves, he became infected through the unconscious with their psychology. No one can shield himself from such an influence. All right, the next chapter is entitled Media Hot and Cold, and it's another important chapter to uh, get an initial understanding of what Marshall um, is doing here. Um, so the difference between hot and cold media, uh, so heat is an increased intensity, right? And, and a cooling is a decreasing of intensity. And he's going to be introducing different forms of media here and, um, you know, explaining the difference between uh, a hot medium and a cold medium here. So here we go. The rise of waltz, explained Curtis Sachs in The World History of Dance, quote, was the result of that longing for truth, simplicity, closeness to nature, and primitivism, which the last two-thirds of the 18th century fulfilled, close quote. In the century of jazz, we are likely to overlook the emergence of the waltz as a hot and explosive human expression that broke through the formal and feudal barriers of courtly and choral dance styles, right? So how the, the, the waltz, the dance, um, is a hot medium and it had a intensifying uh, effect on the social, on the social, the social and the cultural kind of functions. I continue here. There's a basic principle that distinguishes a hot medium like radio from a cool one like the telephone, or a hot medium like the movie from a cool one like TV. A hot medium is one that extends one single sense in high definition, like high resolution. Um, high definition is the state of being well filled with data. A photograph is visually high definition. A cartoon is low definition. 
simply because very little visual information is provided. Telephone is a cool medium, or one of low definition because the ear is given a meager amount of information. And speech is a cool medium of low definition because so little is given and so much has to be filled in by the listener. On the other hand, hot media do not leave so much to be filled in or completed by the audience. Hot media are, therefore, low in participation, and cool media are high in participation or completion by the audience. Right, that's the, the key point there. Um, so hot media are, therefore, low in participation, right? So the radio broadcast is low in participation because you have one person or a small group of people that are broadcasting uh, to an audience, um, and cool media are high in participation or completion by the audience. It'd be interesting to think about Facebook. Is that a hot or a cold medium? Is Twitter a hot or a cold medium? What are the relationships between uh, the old broadcast centralized forms of media like television and um, the movies and the radio juxtaposed with these new forms of media as well? These are the kind of the, the, the thoughts that I think are or the um, ideas that we need to explore if we're going to get a grasp on what's going on in our world currently. So naturally, therefore, a hot medium like radio has very different effects on the user from a cool medium like the telephone. A cool medium like hieroglyphic or ideogrammatic written characters has a very different effects from the hot and explosive medium of the phonetic alphabet. The alphabet, when pushed to a high degree of abstract visual intensity, became typography. The printed word with its specialist intensity burst the bonds of medieval corporate guilds and monasteries, creating extreme individualist patterns of enterprise and monopoly. Right. So here's how the structuring effects of a media of a medium, right, reorient, reorganize, and restructure. Uh, all forms of life. I'll read that again. The printed word with its specialist intensity burst the bonds of medieval corporate guilds and monasteries, creating extreme individualist patterns of enterprise and monopoly. But the typical reversal occurred when extremes of monopoly brought back the corporation with its impersonal empire over many lives. Another key concept and point here is this reversal that will become more... Um, more, more important kind of later on as well. The hotting up of the medium of writing to repeatable print intensity led to nationalism and the religious wars of the 16th century. I'll read that again. The heating up of the medium of writing to repeatable print intensity, right? The, the advent of the printing prints, press led to nationalism and the religious wars of the 16th, 16th century. The heavy and unwieldy media such as stone are time binders, Used for writing, they are very cool indeed and serve to unify the ages, whereas paper is a hot medium that serves to unify spaces horizontally, both in political and entertainment empires. Going on here, any hot medium allows of less participation than a cool one, as a lecture makes for less participation than a seminar and a book for less than dialogue. With print, many earlier forms were excluded from life and art, and many were given strange new intensity. But our own time, the mid-60s, but our own time is crowded with examples of the principle that the hot form excludes and the cool one includes. When ballerinas began to dance on their toes a century ago, it was felt that the art of the ballet had acquired a new quote-unquote spirituality. With this new intensity, male figures were excluded from ballet. The role of women had also become fragmented with the advent of industrial specialism and the explosion of home functions into laundries, bakeries, and hospitals on the periphery of the community. Intensity or high definition engenders specialism and fragmentation in living as in entertainment, which explains why any intense experience must be forgotten, censored, and reduced to a very cool state before it can be learned or assimilated. Uh, this next paragraph here is um, striking. And I would suggest probably read it twice and then kind of reread it and listen to it to get an understanding of what's happening now and how the clashes of old and new media are, are causing 
the uh, mental health issues, this rapid spike in mental health issues that we are seeing now, especially with, um, with COVID-19, where people are forced into their homes and they have nothing to do but to engage with these new types of uh, media. So listen to this uh, paragraph here. So the Freudian quote-unquote censor is less of a moral function than an indispensable condition of learning. Here we go. Were we to accept fully and directly every shock to our various structures of awareness, we would soon be nervous wrecks, doing double takes and pressing panic buttons every minute. Read that again. Were we to accept fully and directly every shock to our various structures of awareness, we would soon be nervous wrecks, doing double takes and pressing panic buttons every minute. It just reminds me of the gaslighting that is done at every corner um, at every level of media that we're seeing right now, right? There's no, the, the idea of, of whether or not um, COVID-19 was uh, released from a lab or it came from an animal is less important than the confusion of not knowing and the onslaught of information that we are, um, that we were subject to, right? And you can, the idea that um, whether or not Trump was a, uh, colluded with Russia and is a Putin puppet, or whether he is not and he's being um, controlled or attempted to be uh, upended is, is less important. It's not as impactful of either of those being right. The, the impact thing, the, the impactful situation is the confusion and the gaslighting that's happening. And I think this sentence, again, I'll read it again. Um, were we to accept fully and directly every shock to our various structures of awareness... We would soon be nervous wrecks doing double takes and pressing panic buttons every minute. The sensor protects our central system of values as it does our physical nervous system by simply cooling off the onset of experience, uh, uh, the onset of experience a great deal. For many people, this cooling system brings one a lifelong state of psychic rigor mortis or of sonambulism, hypnotism, particularly observable in periods of new technology. So yeah, that, I think that is extremely prescient of uh, Mr. McLuhan here. Um, I'm going to read a little bit more um, in, about uh, this example that Marshall is going to be putting forth here of how the introduction of the mass production of the stone axe when given to Australian natives had a rapid destabilization and disintegrating f uh, force on their society. Um, so it gives you an idea how the introduction of tools, which are extensions of man, have this um, intensifying effect on social, cultural, and technological um, ways of being. So here, an example of the disruptive impact of hot technology succeeding a cool one is given by Robert Theobald in The Rich and the Poor. When Australian natives were given steel axes by the missionaries, their culture, based on the stone axe, collapsed. The stone axe had not only been scarce, but had always been a basic status symbol of male importance. The missionaries provided quantities of sharp steel axes and gave them to women and children. The men had even to, the man had even to borrow these from the women, causing a collapse of male dignity. A tribal and feudal hierarchy of traditional kind collapses quickly when it meets any hot medium of the mechanical, uniform, and repetitive kind. The medium of money or wheel, the medium of money or wheel or writing or any for other form of specialist speed up of exchange and information will serve to fragment a tribal structure. Similarly, a very much greater speed up, such as occurs with electricity, may serve to restore a tribal pattern of intense involvement, such as took place with the introduction of radio in Europe and is now tending to happen as a result of TV in America. Specialist technologies detribalize. Specialist technologies detribalize. The non-specialist electric technology retribalizes. Again, think in terms of the new media that were not around in Marshall's time with these in light of these ideas. Um, the process of, of, of upset resulting from a new distribution of skills is accompanied by much culture lag in which people feel compelled to look at new situations as if they were old ones and come up with ideas of quote unquote population explosion in an age of implosion. 
Newton, in the age of clocks, managed to present the physical universe in the image of a clock. But people, but poets like Blake were far ahead of Newton in their response to the challenge of the clock. Blake spoke of the, ne the need to be delivered, quote, from single vision and Newton's sleep. Knowing very well that Newton's response to the challenge of the new mechanism was itself merely a mechanical repetition of the challenge. Blake saw Newton and Locke and others as hypnotized Narcissus types quite unable to meet the challenge of mechanism. W.B. Yeats gave the full Blakean version of Newton and Locke in a famous epigram, quote, Locke sank into a swoon. The garden died. God took, up, took the spinning jenny out of his side. So I'm not going to go into that, that quote here, which he does here. There's one more passage here that I wanted to uh, take from this chapter before we go on to the next one. All right, here's uh, the last paragraph I'll read from this, this chapter here. Scholars today are acutely aware of a discrepancy between their ways of treating subjects and the subject itself. Scriptural scholars of both the Old and New Testaments frequently say that while their treatment must be linear, the subject is not. The subject treats the relations between God and man, and between God and the world, and of the relations between man and his neighbor, all these subsist together and act and react upon one another at the same time. The Hebrew and Eastern mode of thought tackles problem and resolution at the outset of a discussion in a way typical of oral societies in general. The entire message is then traced and retraced again and again on the rounds of a concentric spiral with, the seeming, with seeming redundancy. One can stop anywhere after the first few sentences and have the full message if one is prepared to quote-unquote dig it. The kind of plan seems to have inspired Frank Lloyd Wright in designing the Guggenheim Art Gallery on a spiral, concentric basis. It is a redundant form inevitable to the electric age in which the concentric pattern is imposed by the instant quality and overlay and depth of electric speed. But the concentric with its endless intersection of planes is necessary for insight. This is the key, key point here. But the concentric with its endless intersection of planes is necessary for insight. In fact, it is the technique of insight and as such is necessary for media study since no medium has its meaning or existence alone, but only in constant interplay with other media. In fact, it is the technique of insight and as such is necessary for media study since no medium has its meaning or existence alone, but only in constant interplay with other media. So I'll leave it there for this, this second chapter again hot and cold media and the um, confluence of, of these mediums in our current world is what I'm thinking about here. All right, again, finally, the third chapter that we'll be reviewing here is entitled Reversal of the Overheated Medium. And it's going to, um, I'm going to start out here. So a headline from June 21st, 1963 read, Washington, Moscow hotline to open in 60 days. The Times of London Service, Geneva. The agreement to establish a direct communication link between Washington and Moscow for emergencies was signed here yesterday by Charles Still of the United States and Semyon Tharskin of the Soviet Union. The link known as the hotline will be opened within 60 days, according to U.S. officials. It will make use of least commercial circuits, one capable, the other wireless, using a one cable and the other wireless using teleprinter equipment. That was the, uh, the cable here that's going to be discussed. The decision to use the hot printed medium in place of the cool participational telephone medium is unfortunate in the extreme. No doubt the decision was prompted by the literary bias of the West for the printed form on the ground that it is more impersonal than the telephone. The printed form has quite different implications in Moscow from what it has in Washington. So with the telephone, the Russians' love of this instrument, so congenial to their oral traditions, is owing to the rich, non-visual involvement it affords. The Russian uses the telephone for the sort of effects we associate with the eager conversation of the, lape of the lapel gripper, whose face is 12 inches away. Both telephone and teleprinter as amplifications of the unconscious cultural bias of Moscow on the one hand and of Washington on the other are inventions or invitations to monstrous misunderstandings. The Russian bugs rooms and spies by ear, finding this quite natural. He is outraged by our visual spying, however, finding this quite unnatural. The principle that during the stages of their development, 
all things appear under the forms opposite to those that they finally present is an acts as an ancient doctrine. I read that again. The principle that during the stages of their development, all things appear under forms opposite to those that they finally present is an ancient doctrine. Interest in the power of things to reverse themselves by evolution is evident in a great diversity of observations. Sage and jocular. Alexander Pope wrote, quote, Vice is a monster of such frightful men, as to be hated needs to be seen. But seen too often familiar with its face, we first endure, then pity, then embrace. A caterpillar gazing at a butterfly is supposed to have remarked, quote, Wow, you'll never catch me in one of those dumb things. <laughs> at another level, we have seen in this century the changeover from the debunking of traditional myths and legends to their, rever to their reverent study. As we begin to react in depth to the social life and problems of our global village, and this is the insightful uh, um, passage here, as we begin to react in depth to the social life and problems of our global village, we become reactionaries. Involvement that goes with our instant technologies transforms the most socially conscious people into conservatives. When Sputnik had first gone into orbit, a school teacher asked her second graders to write some verse on the subject. One child wrote, quote, The stars are so big, the earth is so small, stay as you are. With man, his knowledge and the process of obtaining knowledge are of equal magnitude. Our ability to apprehend galaxies and subatomic structures as well is a movement of faculties that include and transcend them. The second grader who wrote the words above lines in a world much vaster than any which a scientist today has instruments to measure or concepts to describe, as W.B. Yeats wrote of this reversal, quote, the visible world is no longer a reality and the unseen world is no longer a dream. Associated with this transformation of the real world into science fiction is the reversal now proceeding apace by which the Western world is going Eastern, even as the East goes Western. Joyce encoded this reciprocal reverse in his cryptic phase, cryptic phrase, quote, the West shall shake the East awake while ye have the night for morn. Close quote. There's so much more here, but that's it. Uh, I just wanted to um, give an introduction to this book and to these first three chapters. And again, please, you know, buy this book, support, um, you know, this type of work. Uh, check out Andrew, Andrew McLuhan and the work that he's doing. He's actually giving a course, a first inaugural course on understanding media. I wasn't able to um, take this one, but it's extremely interesting. Hopefully there'll be more, but please check out this book. Please check out these ideas. And I would love to hear what your, th your thoughts, if this uh, is making sense, if this is interesting, and if you feel like I do that we can uh, make a lot of headway in understanding our current predicament and in predicting our future predicament by understanding the, uh, the technologies and the tools and the media that are operational in our current world. So thanks for listening. Talk to you soon.